plugged on. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I hope, in, I hope uh, everyone watching us is having a nice day. So we are in the third uh, and unfortunately uh, last day um, of uh, Physics Meets Biology, uh, this great uh, joint event between IAPS and IUPAB. Uh, so today, as you can see on the screen there, uh, we're, we're going to have three amazing lectures. Um, but first, we'll just do, um, as we did in the, the first couple of days, uh, quick presentations uh, about IAPS and IUPAB. So you're essentially up to speed about uh, what each uh, of these organizations do. Okay. So um, regarding IAPS, as you can see here, uh, IAPS is uh, very much spread around the world. So it is an international um, association um, that basically gathers students uh, of physics and related areas. Um, at the moment, uh, it is essentially spread throughout all continents uh, in the world. Um, it was founded in 1987, officially. Uh, and of course, it has been um, growing in membership over the years, and this allows for uh, an amazing collaborative uh, environment uh, between the students that participate in IAPS. So this is essentially a spread uh, of the logos of the current members. Uh, so you have uh, over 20 national committees, so national uh, physics students organizations, uh over 20 local committees uh and of course many individual members um, as well so essentially in terms of its identity of course it's a student organization uh at the international level so its constitution as i mentioned is physics students uh, but also students of related uh, courses and usually uh, students that graduate uh, can still be a part of IAPS for up to uh, about a year after um, graduating. So this is um, basically a sum up of the main activities of IAPS. They have Planck's, uh, which is basically an international uh, theoretical physics competition. There's uh, the International Conference of Physics Students, which is basically the flagship uh, event of IAPS. There's uh, the annual excur excursion to CERN and outreach events like the International Day of Light, of which uh, IAPS, uh, which IAPS takes part in, and the School Day, which is organized by our members, members throughout the, the world. So regarding our flagship event, um, it was essentially the event that actually uh, basically brought on uh, IAPS's existence. Uh, hundreds of students participate um, every year. So, of course, unfortunately, during the pandemic uh, in 2020, there was no uh, ICPS. But last year, it was organized online uh, by IAP students in Denmark. This year, it will be online again, organized by students uh, from Mexico. And next year, it will actually be in the, the Philippines. So you can see here a picture of the ICPS 2019 participants in Germany. So regarding Planck's, the physics student competition, um, it usually also gathers uh, around dozens of teams from several countries uh, that are part of IAPS. Uh, so last year, of course, it, was, it also had to be organized online uh, by students in Porto and Portugal. Uh, this year, it will be in a mixed format. Um, so, in presence in Munich, Germany, um, and next year it will be in Italy. So, regarding JIAPS, the Journal of IAPS, this is basically an annual volume um, that IAPS uh, publishes uh, to let its community know, um, and of course everybody uh, else who, who accesses it, uh, what IAPS is all about, so its events, uh, some interesting opinion articles as well, and some, some interesting artwork that basically combines a student's uh, creative artistic side with their uh, love of, um, of science. 
And here you have uh, just a bit of a sum up uh, of our annual calendar. So at the moment, um, there's lots of great events that IAPS is participating in. So there's the EPS Forum, which is occurring um, uh, in June. There's the International Day of Light um, that IAPS has, has been uh, growingly um, participating in. There's also the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable uh, Development. IAPS is going to be very much engaged in that as well. And there was a uh, science con uh, in early Mar uh, uh, April, sorry, organized by IAPS students in Poland. So all of these amazing events that IAPS uh, has also been following and taking part in uh, to make sure that uh, it's a, an engaged community. So we also have lots of grants for uh, our members that you can check out at our website. Uh, students that are a part of IAPS can be involved in many different working groups to basically assist the executive committee uh, in its duties to make sure IAPS is uh, a growing community. And here you can access all of our uh, social media and our website to make sure that you're essentially up to date with all things IAPS. And now uh, I will give the word to Anthony for a presentation on IUPAP. Thank you, Anthony. So thank you very much, Duarte. And my name is Tony Watts. I'm in Oxford in the UK. And um, I am the elect president-elect of IUPAP. And that is the International Union for, for Pure and Applied Biophysics, founded in 1961 which is when many biophysical societies were founded. And the current president is Manuel Prieto in Portugal. And we have a treasurer in Paris, Christina Zizong, and Ronald Clark is our secretary general in Sydney. We have an executive committee, 12 elected uh, councillors worldwide. Next slide, please. Um, we're the World Federation of Organizations in Biophysics. About 61 countries from all around the world are involved with around 12,000 members, which includes national biophysical societies, research councils, and academies, um, as well as three regional organizations uh, in Asia, and particularly the European Biophysical Society Association, EBSA, and Helmut, our next, next speaker, is a former president and Congress organizer, and then also the Latin American Federation. So we really are a worldwide uh, organization. The next slide, please. <clears throat> IUPAP is a member of the International Science Council, which is an overarching science body. It's non-governmental, and it contains 40 or so international scientific unions and associations, advises governments and the United Nations, for example, on science policy, and ethics and many other issues involved with science. And there are many uh, unions, uh, sister organizations are the ones in chemistry, physics, mathematics, biological sciences and biochemistry, molecular biology, all of which have biophysics activities associated with them. Next slide, please. So our mission statement is to coordinate and support research and teaching in biophysics. We have many activities, not least our triennial Congress, and we support conferences, schools, and workshops. And we have three task forces. One is education and capacity building. And this event together with IAPS is one of those. And we're also working with uh, chemistry and biochemistry and molecular biology union. And some of these people are also invited and uh, taking part in, in this particular event. We also have one in structural biology and big data in biophysics, all organizing events uh, under the IO, IUPAB umbrella. Next slide, please. So something, some of the meetings coming up, uh, one on cryo-EM in India. We have a focused meeting in Ottawa in Canada on neurotransmitter gated ion channels. There is no biophysical society in Southern Ireland. So this joint event with the British Biophysical Society is to stimulate more interest in biophysics there. And then in South America, we'll have a biophysics course and then biophysics congress in Brazil. And then the triennial congress will be in 2024 in Kyoto. Second time it's there, it was there in the 1970s as well. And IUPAB will be supporting travel bursaries and also bursaries to people to attend FEBS and EMBO courses who are not eligible for their support. The last slide, please. 
So we look forward to seeing you at meetings and hearing from you. I'm looking forward to the talks today from Helmut, Unan, and Mariana. And thank you very much, IAPS, IAPS for putting on this event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, so now I will give the word then for our first talk on theory and simulation in biology to Helmut Grubmüller. Uh, I hope I'm not, uh, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that well, um, from the Max Planck Institute. Thank you very much. Yeah, many, many thanks to IAPS, IOPAP, uh, Duarte and, and Tony for having me here. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone in the screens. Um, let me try first to, to reshare here my screen so that everything works as before. Uh, just a sec. I should do it. Right. So I can't see the chat. If you be so kind and read the questions once they appear on the chat at the end, that would be super. Thanks a lot. Right. So um, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts. What happens when theory and simulation meets biology? And I should probably say right away, I, I have three heroes I would like to, the stories of whom I would like to share with you, Maxim, Lars, and Leonard. And I'd like to talk about microtubules, about ribosomes, and specifically cool ribosomes. And uh, if time permits, we see how far we get, then we'll talk a little bit about the soul and shell of, of, of proteins. I should also mention a number of collaborators down here and point out that we have a very close collaboration uh, with Holger Stark, who is doing cryo-AM microscopy, Marina Rotnina, who's worth leading in ribosome research, and Dan Wilson, who's also cryo-AM and on the ribosomes. Eva Nogales uh, working on microtubules. So those are our main collaborators here. Let me... Given the audience, let me start a little bigger and then we'll focus down quickly so we don't talk too much about it. But just imagine for a second that a spaceship, an alien spaceship is landing in your backyard. What would happen? I guess all of us would be super curious to look at that advanced technology which made it able for them to travel for light years and then go into it and look at all the gadgets and, and, and machines and how they managed to perform their function. Uh, certainly way advanced to our technology, I would guess. So wouldn't that be great to have something like that and to, to be able to study that and learn from it and advance our technology? Now, actually, believe it or not, that happened to me last autumn, although the spaceship looked a little different. It looked like that. Landed in my backyard, in my garden. and But it's similar. I think this analogy really holds in that it also contains a marvelous range of beautiful machines. We even know how they look like. Huh? They look about like that, and we call them proteins. So if you want to take home one message, proteins, most of the proteins we know, and we know hundreds of thousands of them, are actually molecular machines, and many of them can perform functions which we can only dream of. It's a superb nanotechnology, and they are on a, really on an atomistic scale, literally. And however, like our macroscopic machines, they really work also by moving. So their motions very often uh, actually implement a function. So without knowing how they move, they, we wouldn't understand them. Um, so that's what we call conformational motions. To give you just a short example, so that is a famous machine here. I'll not be focusing on that today, but it's just one of my favorites, uh, ATP synthase. It really resembles a machine because this part here, this central orange axis, they call it gamma subunit, it actually rotates like here from the top view. And it is ro this rotation, mechanical motion, which actually transfer the electrosmotic energy coming from a pH gradient, like a charged battery, and is transferred to the active sites here where actually the ATP, you know, that's the, the fuel of our bodies of all cells is synthesized. So we have an electrochemical mechano and again, back chemical energy transduction, a wonderful machine. And uh, I think it is correct to say that it's, in many respects, it resembles the action of an auto engine, except it doesn't work at 20 or 30 uh, 
100% efficiency like our auto engines, but at near 100% efficiency, fully reversible, not losing any energy. So, so that's what we are aiming for. And that's what I mean when I say quite advanced technology. Development at which, by the way, has, de- has begun like a couple of billion years ago. I should also point out the scale here. It's really atomistic. What you see here is single atoms. And so the, that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to study the function and how they work. They're just too small and they move too fast. So it's very hard to really get a molecular movie from looking at it. Either if you look at it with X-ray crystallography or cryo-EM or, or NMR, you get a l- super long exposure time. And if you look at this gadget here and imagine you have a super long exposure, just what you are most interested in, the moving parts you wouldn't see. Same for the proteins. And the scales are way smaller, and so that makes it particularly difficult. We do have spectroscopic methods which resolve the, the fast motions, but then we don't know what actually moves. And so we don't we are not able to kind of combine both. And that is one reason why I think computer simulations like I'll be sharing with you today are the way to, to really understand the function of these proteins. And not only do they allow us to, to look into detail what actually goes on, uh, they also allow us to, to draw a causal picture, to look at forces, what causes what, rather than just looking at correlations, what happens together with uh, at the same time with other things. So it allows us to really understand what, what's going on. So with this far first quick intro, um, let me also shine light on uh, ribosomes, for example. And I'm showing that and I'll be expanding a little more on those wonderful machines. Uh, because they also are highly dynamic, as this sequence of uh, cryo images really suggests. So just to give you an idea how much motion is in these uh, structures which actually perform uh, their task. In this case, synthesizing all the molecules in your body. So arguably, those are the most important machines in, in your body. Before I show share with you those examples, I would like to briefly explain what molecular dynamic simulations is all about. And I would like to explain it with a, a very simple protein, a membrane protein, which conducts water across the membrane just by means of an example. Um, so at that point, we were interested in how can it be that water can conduct it by this membrane protein so efficiently, about one molecule per nanosecond, uh, and so selectively. And so as an example, what we typically do when we carry out these simulations, we just select a simulation box And then we put the protein, you can see it here from the top, into its native environment. In this case, a membrane, so the yellow greenish stuff, that's uh, lipid membranes. Um, Here you can see the four monomers of of the tetramere. In this case, we add water. And and in any other case I'll be showing you, we will also have explicit water. So every single water molecule is is represented in these simulations. Um, I think it's critical to do that. And then we have a simulation box of uh, typically hundreds of thousands of atoms up to several millions. And then we ask our computer to ask to calculate all forces on all the atoms, um, like indicated here. So electrostatic forces, uh, repulsion, pulse, repulsion, chemical binding forces, you name them. Uh, for the experts summarized in a, fo- in a force field. And once we know all those forces, we can ask our computer to calculate good old Newton how these forces accelerate each single atom. In other words, changes their velocity. And once we know that, we can calculate how the positions have changed a little time later, right? We can't wait too long. In this case, 10 to the minus 15 seconds, a femtosecond. And then all the molecules, all the atoms will have moved such that all the forces have to be recomputed. And then they move again, and then we recompute all the forces again. And so you can see we have a very long loop over and over and over and over again, repeating the same cycle. And after a while, we have what we call a trajectory, which is just on hard disk, the motion of every single atom or the position of every single atom in the simulation system over time. Typically nanoseconds these days up to many microseconds. That's the main limitation of our method. So we can hardly simulate seconds or minutes or hours, but for most biochemical processes, microseconds is, is quite nice. For example, for our water channel, 
I mentioned nanosecond to go through for a water molecule. You can follow quite nicely this yellow water molecule just colored for your convenience uh, passing through. And then comes an important um, aspect. We need to control to check whether our simulations are accurate enough. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, so we need to compare to experiment. In this case, one can nicely measure how much water goes through uh, the, the aquaporin in terms of permeabilities, and that can be compared to the simulation. If that works out, in this case, it does nicely, then we can go on and look into things which cannot be measured or seen under the microscope. So that's the general approach of all the simulations. Many groups leave out the second part, uh, the, the, th uh, the first part, the check against the experiment, I consider it super important. Why is that? Because we don't do as well as we could in our simulations. Ideally, being a physicist, one, one would like to solve the time-dependent shooting equation. That would be a super accurate description of the system. Um, unfortunately, that's computationally way out of reach by today's computer technology. So we have to apply not only one, but three levels of approximation. So that's the, for, for the more physics inclined students among you. So first is the von Oppenheimer approximations. Look it up in the textbook, it's simple. Uh, then we describe all the nuclei in the simulation system classically according to, I mentioned Newton's law previously. And you may say, oh gosh, we learned that atoms are intrinsically quantum mechanical objects. Yes, but at room temperature, and in a condensed phase where all the interference and the coherence is destroyed immediately, that's actually a quite good approximation, yet not perfect. And then I mentioned already a force field which describes all the interactions. And that again is an approximation to what otherwise you would love to calculate quantum mechanically, namely the electron ground wave function. Okay, so these are the three approximations just as an excursion for, for our experts here, but also to show you two things first, all the simulations rest on fundamental physics laws, like the Schrodinger equation. It's not that we just make up a protein of springs and balls like some may portray it. No, all those is, is, is grounded solidly in fundamental physics laws. And But second, because we use approximations, we always have to check really whether we are accurate enough. How do we do that? One example I would like to share with you is the type of experiment which always has fascinated me is to tear apart single molecules, which became possible in the 90s with groundbreaking work by Hermann Gaub and Bill Hensen and others. So they really measured the force which re is required to, to rupture, uh, in this case, a streptavidin biotin case. That's historic data here on the left. These days it's way more accurate. And we thought, well, can't we do that in the simulation also? And yes, we can. And we all, all we need to do is to, to apply a harmonic potential, which mimics the, the cantilever of the atomic force microscope. And again, also pull by the same token in the same way to at, at the molecule being drawn out of the Sertavidin, like in the original experiment. By the way, whenever I show this kind of movies with these ribbon plots here, underlying each of those movies is an atomistic representation of the computer, atom by atom, as I have shown you before for the aquaporin. It's just for simplicity of the representation that we draw it that way. Also the water and everything fully taken into account, just not shown. And you can see this seemingly simple unbinding process from a bound over a barrier to an unbound state is actually quite complex as this force landscape actually shows you. Every single peak here is reproducible and testifies the rupture, for example, of a hydrogen bond or something. And, and the, the pathway out of the binding site is not just an on-off process, it's through many intermediates which are revealed through this simulation. Now, is that now accurate? Now, we can now directly compare the force which we calculate just as the maximum force here from the simulation with the experimental one. And actually we did that a um, while ago. However, it's not so easy at that time. So what you see here is how fast we pull the loading rate. Now, due to technical restrictions, mostly the resonance frequency of the cantilever, our experimental colleagues couldn't go faster than this here. Um, so that's the experimental data. Whereas with the computer techni technology available at that time in the mid nineties, we couldn't go slower than this. Remember, the slower we pull, the longer trajectories we need, and that makes a huge computational effort. So this point is very cheap. This point was at that time about a year of computer time at the best computers we had at that time. 
So there's a gap of like six orders of magnitude. Um, so hard to compare. It doesn't look too bad, but it's a bit difficult to compare. It was good enough for science at that time, but today we can do better. And this, we, we re revisited that quite recently. And so now you see that's data by Simon Scheuring here, the blue points, same system, range up to here. So he's the world record holder in fastest pulling. And that's us here, the green points. And you see now a nice overlap. And I should really emphasize, there is not a single fit parameter, not a single one. You do the simulation, it agrees or it doesn't. If it doesn't, you throw it into the bin. If it does, nice. So in this case, and in many other cases we have seen, you really find nice agreement without any twiggle. So that gives some confidence in, in the accuracy of those simulations, which led us to, to move on. And, and that is now the first uh, story I'd like to share with you, um, to look at things which otherwise you, you cannot see so easily. And that is, for example, the tips of microtubules. So that's work by Maxim here. And some of you may know, microtubules are the highways in our cell, but also the one of the important force generating engines in our cells. They're composed of uh, small dimers, tubulins, which can uh, be loaded with nucleotides, uh, GTP in the high energy form. It's a relative uh, related molecule to ATP, which I mentioned before, and GDP in case it's hydrolyzed into GTP in phosphate. So with GTP loaded dimers, which will always be orange here, microtubules assemble. They grow at the, at the tip here, um, and this is shown also with his chymographs here under the microscope here. So you can see they get longer and longer, the growing phase. And then at some point, nobody knows how really and why, they, there's a catastrophic decay and they shrink. And that has to do with getting more and more of them hydrolyzed into blue GDP dimers, right? So once they are, the majority is GDP, they get they disassemble and then the cycle starts anew. Now it has been argued that, like indicated in this sketch here, that the, the, the more intact these tips are, the more they are an intact hose, if you want, the easier it is for the GTP dimers to assemble to them, like in crystal growth. Whereas if they are splayed out, like indicated here, then they tend to decay. And that was the, the idea, the hypothesis, how the GTP or the nucleotide state, either GTP or GDP actually would affect growth or, or disassembly. So that was the idea. And I, I should, by, by the way, mention this splaying and, and catastrophic decay that is used in the cell as, as a motor. And if you remember these wonderful movies on, on mitosis where the chromosomes are, have to be teared apart in, before the cell separates into two, um, this tearing apart is driven by, by the kinotochore, which is a, the, the head complex of in this case of the microtubule. So they tear apart this by disassembling microtubules. That's where the energy comes from. Wonderful movies. And, and that's one of the reasons why we got so interested in that. Now, this idea of intact versus splayed tubes making the difference between growing and shrinking got shattered recently by wonderful microscopy data, electron microscopy data here, which I'm showing here. The top row is growing and the bottom row is shrinking. And what's shown here in green are exactly those, those things here, which are called protofilaments, yeah, which make up the whole microtubule. And can you see a difference? No, you can't, not a thing. So they really look alike, whether growing or shrinking. Not that the growing are more intact and the shrinking are more splayed, as I said before, no. That shattered the whole theory. And that's where we got quite interesting. What then links the growing and shrinking phase to the nucleotide stage? So the first thing we did is, um, we looked at the monomers. And also there, there were theories around which, how the nucleotide state co connects to the, to the properties of the monomers. After all, everything needs to be explained in a reductionistic way from the monomer uh, perspective in the first place. So there was the idea that actually the monomers don't differ much whether they are GTP or GDP state. It's just that the lateral interaction in the lattice and there's a corresponding thermodynamic cycle, which I don't have the time to go into, but it's the lateral interactions which are modulated by the nucleotide state and thereby have stronger interactions for the ATP and GTP state 
and thereby they are assembled. And it was known pretty well that they can undergo a kink motion. So if they are free, uh, they are kinked. And if they are in the lattice, they are straight, fitting the lattice very well. And, and that's how you store energy also in the system, which then drives the engine. So that was one view. And the other view was the so-called allosteric view, where the intrinsic properties of the molecule by the dimer are modulated by the state in that in the GTP loaded state, the straight conformation is fitting into the lattice is more stable thermodynamically, whereas in the GDP state, it's the kinked one. Yeah. So there's again, two, two theories. So we started to look into that and into the free energy landscape of this kinking motion as indicated here on the y-axis. That's the angle between the kink left GTP, right GDP. Do you see a difference between the center of mass of these histograms here? No. So they don't change much. The minimum stays the same, which rules out the allosteric uh, model. However, also the flexibility is quite different. So here it's super flexible in GTP. Yeah? You have a, a large vari variation of, of the angle between them. Whereas in GDP, they're quite stiff, only small variation, which rules out this one. So we had, we came up with a, what we call a combined, takes the best of the two model where it's the stiffness, the mechanical stiffness of this dimer, which plays the whole game. And we suggested based on that, a new thermodynamic cycle. And then with all those components at, at hand, um, by the way, also checking in the experiment against uh, the overall stiffness of the molecules, which we will also calculate from the simulation. So that agrees pretty nice, yeah. So GDP is way stiffer also in, in terms of longitudinal extension uh, compared to GDP that has been measured, agrees nicely. So with all that at hand and with all that checks, we can go on and to the really huge simulations, 15 million atoms each, fully atomistic, no coarse graining, fully solvent, explicit solvent, and, and simulate this splaying, right? So we start out with intact uh, tubules uh, in the simulation, both GDP and GDP loaded, and then start the simulation and see what happens. And that's what you see in the simulations. You see this playing right away over several microseconds in this case. But you can also see that the right one, the GDP, plays way, way quicker due to the stiffer kink, right, uh, compared to the left one. And that happens not only once, of course. These days, we have to reproduce several times and do statistics. So that's five independent simulations, and all of them look pretty alike which allows us to really now quantify the mechanical properties from these simulations in, in these systems here. Um, and we identified for the protofilament mainly two binding modes, a twist bending mode, which is a more radial motion, which you have also seen in the simulations, but there is also a tangential swing motion, uh, which turns out to be pretty important in fact. The simulations allow us to generate energy landscape, free energy landscape for all the relevant degrees of freedom and estimate in particular, the energy it costs, third, uh, 16 kT versus 25 kT for GTP and GDP respectively, to bend the system from the equilibrium curved state to the straight lattice fitting state. So that's an indication how, how things work. Also, we looked at the lateral interactions and found, again, differences between the ATP and uh, GTP and GDP loaded stage on here. For the expert, the microtubules also have what's called a seam and everything is different there. No time to go into that, but we have also analyzed that and understand that. Taking everything together, what we now think happens is that we have an, a, a tug of war between if we want to form a microtubule, between the straightening and out of the microtubules of the protofilaments, that's this axis here, right? So that's from curved to straight and this tangential swing motion, which is this axis here. And we have an intermediate state where we have not yet fully straight one, but they get in contact with each other, which provides some energy because the intermolecular in protofilament, interprotofilament energies also are favorable here for the GDP state. And taking it, all that into a single, single model creates this energy landscape, which is dictated 
by the straight and curved and partially adjacent state. So that's a prediction that we would observe that in the uh, in reality also. And it's the population of those and the kinetics between those states which dictates whether you are growing or shrinking. So that would be our proposal. Is that true? Well, one prediction is actually that if that is true, one should see dimers and trimers of attached protofilaments rather than splaying all of them, right? And very recently, um, the Dr. Rom, uh, Dr. Rom lab has come up with a wonderful picture which came out after we published that, where you actually see precisely that a few of those protofilaments really attached together into groups very much as our model predicts. So I think that uh, adds some uh, evidence that we are actually uh, describing the whole system at least qualitatively in the right way. And I think we have understood now much better how microtubules grow and shrink and how that connects to uh, GDP hydrolysis. Let me switch gears and move on to Lars Bock's work. Um, he uh, works for a long time already. Now he's, he's the expert on, micro, um, on ribosomes. And just to refresh your memory, ribosomes function and synthesize growing proteins um, by adding one after the other amino acids to that growing nest and chain, which leaves the micro, uh, the, <laughs> I'm still with microtubules, um, leaves the ribosome through an exit tunnel here. And that works, you can see that again in this, I think very nice movie here by uh, tRNAs, which carry the fitting, uh, the fitting amino acid on this side, ready to be attached at the active site here, the PTC. And on the other side, I, they have a triple codon, which then must fit to the messenger RNA. So for each triple on the messenger RNA, there's a tRNA, which carries the right amino acid. So that's how this whole thing works. And that's actually how the genetic code actually is implemented and, and, trans, and translated in the ribosomes. Okay, so that's how it looks dynamically. And now we have looked into the tunnel that's also worked by Michael Kola here, how this adding one after the other amino acid actually works. And I just show you one movie to give you an impression um, how the whole, yeah, it's highly flexible. So it's a kind of a cooked spaghetti, which is kind of pushed through a winding tunnel. That's not so easy. And uh, we are currently looking at how, how that actually works. So that's just to give you an impression. But we also looked into that because antibiotics preferably or many of, of the known antibiotics preferably bind into the exit tunnel, um, like for example, erythromycin, and this is work again by Lars and others together with the, uh, with the, uh, with the lab uh, of, uh, of Dan Wilson. Uh, and there with his cryo -M data, you can see the bound uh, microtubule here in the tunnel. In this case, the tunnel goes downward, sorry for the rotation here. And here you can see the two tRNAs, which actually are bound here very nicely. And that's actually part of the growing chain uh, for the new peptide, the nest and peptide. And now it was thought that this antibiotics obviously works very simple, right? It's like a cork in a bottle. Yeah, You plug the, the exit tunnel, the nest and chain can't get out, that's it. I should mention that's how it should work in the bacteria, not in our ribosomes, right? Hopefully that makes uh, good antibiotics that it doesn't work in the wrong micro, uh, ribosome. Anyway, it has been found, however, that certain sequences, like this one shown here, actually passes this cork. So it's not a cork which is super tight, it's only a partial cork, which raises the question why certain sequences can pass and being transcribed, translated, and others cannot. And Lars looked very much deeply into that, thanks to the structure of Daniel Wilson, I was able to simulate both in the presence and in the absence of this bound uh, antibiotics here, as kinetic view, what happens. And uh, just to show you, if you remove the erythromycin, you can't do an electron microscope anymore, so you have to rely on the simulations. But then you see that this growing chain uh, is not attached to this tunnel wall anymore formed by the ribosome, but really moves right inside. And what I also see, and that was a new finding, is that not only do we have this partial interaction with the tunnel wall, which explains a number of mutations and a, a fraction of the sequence dependency, but we also have an allosteric action. The binding of the erythromycin here deforms the tunnel wall like 10 angstrom above, quite a distance above, which 
being negatively charged, remember there's a number of phosphates on the RNA, which interacts with a positively charged lysine here and really drags it to the left, perturbing the stereochemistry of this nucleophilic attack, which is necessary for this amino acid to be attached to the growing chain here. So rather than blocking like in a cork, it perturbs the core of the synthesis machinery, the PTC and the nucleophilic attack, the chemistry which needs to go on to form this peptide bond. And that's the reason why most of the sequence actually stalls, quite a surprise. So we have a combined mechanism, which I think thanks to our simulations, we understand now much better. Now, having worked with cryo-electron microscopy groups for quite a while now, um, it didn't escape our attention that everything works at cryogenic temperature, of course, that hence the name. And what they do is they, uh, they observe actually quite the structural heterogeneity. So this is cryo end data in terms of B factors where part of the room temperature structure ensemble and therefore part of the motions are actually shock frozen and preserved, right? So what they do is um, they, they, pl shock, they plunge uh, the grid where the proteins are actually uh, in, in, maintained in, in liquid. They plunge the whole thing as fast as they can into liquid ethane at 70 Kelvin or something, um, shock freezing everything in a very short time, hoping that all the motions are actually preserved. And in fact, if you carry out molecular dynamics simulations, um, you do see uh, quite a bit of similarity, but not perfect yeah, to what we see in the cryo EM. So it seems that part of it is actually preserved, maybe part of it not. And that's actually the question which we address here. How much of the room temperature, structural heterogeneity and dynamics is actually preserved when we shock freeze uh, that for the cryo EM? So how much about the room temperature can we actually learn from analyzing the heterogeneity of cryo uh, images or structures, right? So that's the question. And what happens there? So imagine we have a number of different conformations at room temperature. Just imagine maybe a side group uh, flipping back and forth, like indicated here, maybe more complicated. In any way, you will have a broad ensemble of interacting or interchanging of different these structures indicated by this free energy landscape. And all the minima here will be more or less populated according to, yeah, Boltzmann factor essentially, right? So that's what the dynamics which is going on in, at room temperature. Now, if you shock freeze that instantaneously, you can't do that, but just uh, imagine, then nothing would move anymore and it would 100% would be preserved. Great, that's what we would like to see, but not fast enough, of course. So what rather would happen most likely is that during shock freezing, part of those um, structures at higher minima have time to, to diffuse towards the lowest minimum, enhancing the population there and depriving those minima from population. So part of those uh, will be preserved, but only, but not everything. If you wait for an infinite time, everything will be in the deepest minimum, but that's also not what happens, yeah? So we have to find out actually how much of that process happens during shock freezing. And that's the question which we raised here very recently, how much structural heterogeneity is preserved. Or maybe we can also make a statement about, I mean, there's a whole broad spectrum of energy barriers, how large energy barriers can be overcome during pooling and how large cannot, right? So that's also one question which we addressed. In order to do so, first question was, how fast is the cooling anyway? And if you ask the experts in the field, they tell you, well, the whole plunge freezing process, we managed to, to put it into liquid ethane within a few milliseconds. Now, however, that doesn't exactly reflect the perspective of a single ribosome here, right? We, we, we actually looked at the ribosomes because this one will be plunged first and this one and this one, if you imagine the whole grid be plunged into the grid, like into the liquid as indicated here. So what happens from the perspective of a single ribosome? And to our surprise, our continuum model calculations suggest it would be as fast as maybe a tens or hundreds of nanoseconds. Yeah, shown here for different widths of the water layer, which we can't measure exactly. So we just looked at the number of different widths here. So hundreds of nanoseconds. And that told us, hey, we can simulate that. Mind you, we can do microseconds. So why don't we simulate that one-to-one? -one? And that's actually what lasted. So he shock froze 
in the simulation, the ribosomes, and that's how that looks like. Quite nice, yeah, it stops moving, but you can see there's still quite a bit of motion going on during this now real-time cooling process. And that allows us to do now careful statistics, repeating the whole process many times, of course, and with different cooling rates uh, to look at how much of the fluctuation actually vanishes during the shock cooling. And uh, I will not go into detail here, but separating small fast motions from large slow motions and look at different cooling rates here. Each of these windows is a separate simulation at fast and increasingly slower cooling here. Um, we were able to actually come up with a simple model, which that's the blue here, with just a few fit parameters, which fits all the different groups which we have looking at quite nicely in the ribosome. And long story short, cross-check, does that agree with time-dependent ictra crystallography? Yes, without further fitting constant, it does. So that's nice. And long story short, we lose about 20 to 30% of the fluctuation during shock freezing, which means if now there's some data from CryoM on, on the heterogeneity, we know what factor to add and we know which groups, in fact, uh, need to be corrected by which factor, that's just a global measure here, in order to recover the room temperature ensemble. And I think that's a nice thing to have and uh, we're looking to collaboration. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, you still have about, uh, I would say, five minutes. Uh, that's so we can perfectly. That's great. Thanks a lot. So that allows me to have a short glance on now for those who are maybe more physics inclined, that we can also uh, do some very nice fundamental non-equilibrium thermodynamics to understand in this particular case better the thermodynamics of the solvent shell around the protein. So that's the few, first few water layers around the protein whose properties are quite different from bulk water, which is known for quite a long time. And of course, that has to do also with the hydrophobic effect. So we'll looking at, be looking into that. And in specific, I need to skip a few slides. Sorry for that. We want to look at the stability of proteins. So everyone knows a folded protein is stable because of a tug of war again between two very large contributions to the free energy of the folded proteins relative to the free energy of the unfolded protein. And that is these two contributions are the enthalpy. So enthalpically, a folded protein is way more stable because there's all those interactions which are formed, salt bridges, H bonds, and so on. So there's many favorable interactions in a folded protein which enthalpically make it, make it way more favorable hundreds of kilojoules. Now, the total free energy between folded and unfolded is just a few kilojoules. And that is because there's this opposing entropic contribution, T delta S to the total free energy, which of course favors the many states an unfolded protein can adopt versus the only very few states a folded protein can adopt. So we have this tug of war here. Now, everyone knows if you heat up a protein, then it unfolds and the reason is if you increase the temperature here, then this factor overweighs the enthalpy contribution and the unfolded state becomes more stable. And of course, by the same token, if you shrink the temperature, if you lower the temperature, then the enthalpy will overweigh and the protein will become even more stable. That's what you might think. Now, unfortunately, the nice theory is totally wrong because if you, if you cool down proteins, many of them also unfold. So this is called cold denaturation. So something is totally wrong here. And what is wrong is we forgot the solvent. It may be true what I was saying for the protein, but we missed all the protein solvent interactions. And it is those which in this case are weakened and therefore make the unfolded state again, more favorable, quite contrary to what the simple theory might suggest. So that's motivation enough to look at the solvent shell. and. That is what Leonard Heinz did. And of course, there's a lot of, um, uh, of, of attempts. Uh, there's a small list here to characterize the thermodynamics of proteins and the entropy of a proteins from simulation. However, all of those don't have spatial resolution. And I'm happy to discuss that in the questions to come up with a spatially resolved concept of an entropy. It's a challenge in itself, but I think we were able to do that in a clean, 
and consistent thermodynamically or statistically mechanically consistent way. So just to give you one idea, we want to calculate the entropy and enthalpies of the water shell. Now, water is molecules diffuse around all the place. So that already makes it a bit challenging, but we come up with a method and that goes back to work of Friedemann Reinhardt in my group to relabel all the water molecules such as to that uh, water molecules always remains roughly in the same region uh, during the simulation. So whenever two water molecules, for example, in the simulation exchanges their position, we just relabel them. And you need to understand that that doesn't change anything about the physics. The label is just what keeps track on the molecules on the computer. Um, and so we don't change the physics at all, but we make the whole thing amendable to statistical mechanics. And I'm not telling anything new here. That's the famous Gibbs factor. So that's 100 years old. Same story in a new dress, right? But that enables us, together with a little bit of a few tricks, which I don't have to, the time to, to move into, and let me go to the protein immediately to characterize uh, both the entropy and the enthalpy of the solvent shell of a protein uh, in detail, spatially resolved. And we did that for a simple protein crumbing, both for the folded state left and for a model of the unfolded state, which you can see on the right side. And we were asking what interactions are at play here and, and what determines actually the, the folded state, what stabilizes the folded state. And you might argue, well, that's very well known. We have hydrophilic residues and we have hydrophobic residues. And as soon as we have hydrophobic residues exposed on the surface, that will clearly destabilize the, the folded state and drive it into the native fold, which, as you know, has all the hydrophobic residues in the interior of the protein, inside the protein, and the hydrophilic residues exposed. So that's what you would think. Well, we can check that now. And uh, again, uh, that's a complicated plot, no time to go into. But just to show you now that we have a map of everything we want to have a look at. For example, for the native fold left, uh, the enthalpic part here separated into what the enthalpy interaction between protein and solvent and the solvent-solvent interactions, which are super important. We have the entropy part here, also split up into single, molecule, single water molecule entropies and entropies which arise from correlations, higher correlations between water molecules, which will turn out to be super important. And, and that we have for the translational free degrees of freedom of the water, as well as the rotational one. Yeah, If you uh, fix the orientation of a water molecule by a nearby charge, for example, such that it's always oriented towards the charge, that will intrude its entropy. Same thing for the molten globule state. Long story short, um, one thing you might want to look at is, for example, how does the total entropy, uh, free energy difference between folded and unfolded state relate for each residue on the surface and the interior relate to the hydrophobicity of the ref respective residue. And yes, there's some correlation. So the high, highly hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic ones are really uh, stabilizing a bit. That's shown here, negative delta G or delta F. But on the other hand, all those here uh, on the hydrophobicity scale they scatter wildly around, but there's no real correlation. So maybe it doesn't play such a role as you might think reading the textbooks. But look at that, for example. What's shown here is the convexity of the surface. So there are, hydro, there are kind of uh, uh, valleys on, on the surface of the protein, uh, which are more concave and more convex loops exposed to the surface. Look at that beautiful correlation. So here, the geometry of surface highly correlates with the enthalpic contribution of the water to the stability of the protein. So we would suggest that has been overlooked quite a bit and that turns out to be important. You can also look at the overall contribution. First of all, we reproduce nicely the delta G of folded versus unfolded known from experiment. So that's nice, reassuring. Everything again calculated from first principles. We also reproduce, of course, as it should be, this tug of war of the huge destabilizing entropic contribution from the protein, that's the P here, versus the enthalpy contribution uh, between protein and solvent interactions, for example, but also protein protein. So we nicely reproduce that. But then we can look at the water. And in the water, we see that 
solvent-related entropy contributions stabilize the folded state by almost 500 kilojoule per mole. That's almost as much as, as the dominant contributions, which we saw from this talk, tug of war here. Uh, so the water is equally important, which immediately explains this cold denaturation because those contributions get weaker. Now it's an entrop mostly entropic part. They get weaker if you cool down and they stabilize the protein opposite to the protein entropy, which destabilizes. Uh, that explains that. And then we go into detail. For example, we can say that largest contributions uh, mostly uh, come by the correlations. So not the individual molecule entropy, which is easy to look at, but by the correlations. I think that's an important finding also. And I just very briefly remember, some of you might know very famous work by Ben Naim, and many interpret his work, not himself, but others interpret his work such that uh, these two terms, solvent-solvent terms, cancel out totally, and thereby uh, the solvent cannot contribute to protein stability. That is totally at odds with our finding, and actually the referees pointed that out, um, and we were a bit shocked, but easily saw, and I'm uh, skipping the math here, but at some point we easily saw there is a conceptual misunderstanding widespread in the field, and the misunderstanding comes from thinking that these solvent-solvent entropy contributions only belong to the solvent. Closer analysis shows, no, they don't. And that resolves in full agreement what Ben Naim has written in his original papers, the whole, um, the whole seeming uh, contradiction. So I'm not going into detail here, but sometimes it's really worth looking at the original publications because misunderstanding spreads so easily in the literature. We are the process of writing that up now, but the referees were happy, we were happy, and we can uphold our main conclusion. It's the solvent response that can and does drive protein folding to a really large uh, extent. And it's not the entropy of the individual solvent molecules, as you might read in uh, physical chemistry uh, textbooks. It's the correlations between the solvent molecules, which are hardly accessible by by theory, but we can do that now with our methods. Okay, so let me get to the end. There's a whole slew of processes which we can study with molecular dynamic simulations. Let me just mention work by Bertie Groth and, and members of his group in my department on looking at ion channels or uh, ligand binding, for example. So with all the implications for pharmacology, where we are able to now look at induced fit binding, which with uh, conventional docking methods is just not accessible or moving even to larger systems like synaptic vesicles, organelles, et cetera. So it's really a challenge to move upwards. And you may have seen wonderful work by Gerhard Hummer on uh, COVID uh, spike proteins, which are also pretty huge. And uh, mind you, our microtubules, almost uh, world record now being also super huge systems. So we get to larger and larger system over history. And I just want to remind you, everything, everything I have shown you goes back to the shooting equation directly or indirectly versus several approximations. And I think it's a absolutely fascinating thought that in order to explain stuff like that, everything is in the shooting equation. You don't need more, that's my belief. And I'm really happy to be in exciting times of, of, in, in this direction of this development here that we can simulate larger and larger systems and understand more and more about life processes, how life fundamentally works. And that's what, what really makes me super excited in this field. And I hope I could share some of this excitement with you. I just show you the summary. I don't read it up. Uh, I think I mentioned everything. I think the three major uh, people here in the examples I showed, I would like to thank my whole group. I very much hope that we will meet again more like this way rather than this way in the future. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Helmut. So um, we are uh, a bit behind schedule, um, mostly also that. because of the, of the, oh, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, mostly because of the, the initial um, uh, presentations. Um, so I will propose, there are a couple of questions uh, from the YouTube chat. Uh, I will propose that um, uh, we, we take a look at, at those questions. Uh, I'll read them out. Um, and then after the, the questions, 
if there's uh, any additional notes uh, that you can could uh, try to maybe condense in about a, a minute, um, then uh, you can um, uh, move to to that. Uh, so I'll start with the the more um, technical um, question. So for the bending and swinging free energy landscapes that you showed, did you use biased simulations or estimated it from unrestrained MD? Yeah, that's a very good question. I didn't have the time to expand on that. For the moment, we uh, estimated it from the unrestrained MD. So we know, for example, the, the friction um, uh, of uh, the, uh, the whole protofilament through water and that allowed us to, to estimate the energy which is set free by the bending. So that relates to the full protofilament. Now, when you refer to the landscapes, that has been done actually uh, by unrestrained molecular dynamics. So for the experts, no umbrella sampling, nothing, just unrestrained MD, and, and that give us the, the these energy landscape. But that was the dimer only, yeah? the individual building blocks, not the whole protofilament. But of course, the two are related. Does that kind of answer the question? I believe so. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, and the the other question, uh, more a, a bit of a, a general one. Um, uh, a person is mentioning, I uh, did an experiment about uh, the light and frost effect. Do you have any advice where I can publish my work? Well, that's a difficult one. Um, well, the, if it's a great result, Publish in Nature Science or Physio Flatters. Um, if it's a not so great result, more of a specialist channel, I, I really don't know what, what advice I, I could give here. Um, I Maybe as a general remark, I don't think that where you publish is actually super important anymore. Um, it's nice to have it in your CV, no question. But if you really think about serving science, your paper, if it's good, will be found anyway. Um, by all the different search engines and so on. I, I would think uh, that trying to publish by all means in, in science and nature may in the short run benefit your CV and foster your career. It's, I think that's an undeniable fact. But I, let me just pose it as a question to think about every one of us, whether it uh, serves our scientific enterprise, the science as a whole, is to me, yeah, think about it, it may not always be so obvious whether that would really serve science. Um, so, yeah, uh, I guess um, publish in the channel where you think your readership is. Um, of course, the European Biophysics Journal is a nice channel to publish. And uh, so, I think it's not so super important anymore where to publish. Way more important is that the paper is great. And as you all know, you are judged by the citations you get and you are judged by the reputation you get from your papers and not so much by the journal you publish. Thank you very much, uh, Helmut. So uh, is there any uh, like final note or message uh, in a, about a minute uh, that you'd like to, to leave us with? From my side? Yes. Oh, enjoy science, have fun in science. Uh, Try to pick a project which you're really absolutely exciting on. It doesn't suffice to say, ah, oh, that is kind of interesting. You have to be in love with your project. And if you're in love, then you will get great results. And then that fosters further. So do science because you burn for it. If you don't burn for it, don't do science. That would be my plea. It's Thank you great, very much. Yeah, it's a great privilege that we can do science in these times. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Helmut. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, I will um, give the word to um, uh, our second speaker uh, on a talk about optimizing nanopores for DNA sequencing, a molecular simulation perspective. Uh, so Punam Ratu from the University of Southampton. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation to um, talk today. I'm very excited um, to share my uh, work so far. Um, I just need to share my slides. 
So I hope um, this is all visible to everyone. Yes. Oh, that's great. Okay, so um, I'm a PhD candidate um, from the University of Southampton. And today I'll be talking to you about my work that I've done during my um, PhD, which is um, mostly molecular dynamic simulations um, of nanopores for DNA sequencing. So um, DNA is um, often referred to as the code of life and it's um, found in all living organisms. And um, it essentially encodes all the information that's required to build and maintain life. The information in the DNA molecule is stored as a sequence of four subunits called bases. And if we can sequence um, the DNA, we can gain a lot of in, invaluable information about an organism. So for example, if we can compare the sequence of a healthy um, cell and a cancer cell, we can identify which parts of the DNA are altered in cancer. And this way we can uh, develop targeted treatments specifically um, for treating the cancer. My research interest lies in nanopore-based DNA sequencing. Our sponsors, Oxford Nanopores, actually use this um, technology in their devices to offer a cheap and convenient way of sequencing DNA. And nanopore-based biosensors work using simple part, uh, principles of physics. So um, in the setup, you have two compartments that are separated by an impermeable membrane. And they're connected only by this nanometer-sized hole. And these holes um, can be formed um, synthetically, so they can be engineered synthetically in this material, or they can be formed by proteins that naturally um, form nanometer-sized um, holes. Each compartment uh, contains charged ions. So when a voltage is applied across this membrane, the charged ions move through this nanopore and generate a current that can be measured. As DNA is also a charged molecule, it too gets pulled through this um, nanopore. And luckily for us, the four DNA bases each block the pore current to a characteristic degree. So we can measure the current blocked and identify the bases directly. Oxford nanopores use proteins as nanopores in their devices. So my research has um, mostly been focusing, uh, focused on helping them optimize um, their proteins for DNA sequencing. And um, when we think about optimizing nanopores, we can de generally divide it into these three areas. And my focus has specifically been on um, Looking, in, um, looking at the sequencing region. And uh, this sequencing region is the narrowest region of the nanopore where the um, bases are identified. And my, my aim is to um, achieve two things. What we want is the DNA to translocate slowly so that each base resides for a long enough time in the sensing region to get a very clear current signal. And the second goal is to um, make sure that when the DNA passes through, it's very linear. So it doesn't coil and kink and um, uh, cause the bases to be passing through in the wrong order. So um, for my project, we are using uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, to study the nanopores at a molecular level. And um, as, uh, we, as you all heard earlier, there's, there are a lot of advantages to um, using MD simulations. So we can investigate aspects that, um, that we can't look into using experiments, such as, uh, in my case, the interactions between the DNA and the nanopore. Um, in MD simulations, um, the atoms are uh, represented as um, 
squidgy balls and the covalent bonds are represented as springs and uh, they are propagated in time using Newtonian mechanics. And um, the atoms are assigned uh, their chem chemical characteristics such as masses and charges via something called a force field. And this, uh, this is informed from uh, experimental data. And um, we can obtain the potential energy of the molecules from this force field. And it turns out that the force acting on each atom can be determined from the potential energy of the system. This means we can use the force um, to calculate the movement of the atoms and their updated position in the next time step uh, using the um, equation force times mass equal uh, mass force equals mass times acceleration. <laughs> And um, by repeating this process over time, we can move atoms in a biochemically informed way, and we can generate a movie that predicts the time dependent behavior of the molecules. So uh, just to summarize our previous work on nanopores, uh, what we know so far is that um, DNA can be slowed down when it, uh, by binding to charged amino acids in the protein nanopores, um, which is great, but unfortunately, the binding can also cause um, DNA to coil and kink, which can lead to the bases being identified in the wrong order. However, when the pores are hydrophobic, like here, um, DNA is actually retained in a um, linear conformation as it passes through. So taking this forward, what we wanted to do was to see if we can slow down the DNA and keep it in a linear conformation. So um, for this project, we designed nanopores with two hydrophobic constriction regions. And we simulated these to see if DNA translocation is slowed down. So we started with um, plain pores. So um, the, these, these uh, plain pores were of two sizes. Uh, the 14 stranded pore is um, a narrower um, cylinder than the 16 stranded pores. And these, these pores are plain apart from the constriction regions we've added in um, each of them. And we, um, we um, made these constrictions by incorporating uh, leucine phenylalanine or tryptophan, um, which are all hydrophobic amino acids. Um, they vary in their hydrophobicity and um, also their size. So you can see that um, tryptophan is um, a bulky amino acid. It's got a bigger side chain than uh, leucine, which is um, much smaller. And our aim was to understand how the geometry um, of these pores and the chemical nature of these um, constrictions uh, impact the DNA translocation. So um, we looked at the translocation of two types of DNA. So the, the shorter flexible DNAs and longer DNA under tension. And um, we ran the simulations with um, DNA starting off inside the pole. And um, we moved the DNA through by applying an, an electric field, which is like the um, voltage. Uh, so for the short DNA, if the movie plays, yeah. So for, um, for the short DNA, um, it was very visually um, clear to see that um, DNA um, movement is faster through the um, 14 LL2 pore here compared to in the 16 WW2 pore here. Um, and um, we can see the same in the D um, DNA translocation rate as well. Um, the translocation rate through the 14 LL2 pore was the fastest out of all of them. So here we can say that we've achieved one of the aims, um, which was to slow down translocation. 
um, we can see that uh, DNA movement is slowed down in pores um, that have either phenylalanine or tryptophan constriction regions. And uh, DNA was slowed down um, in the 16WW2 pore because of this uh, nice shape complementarity between the um, DNA basis and the tryptophan residues in the constriction region. And it's because of this that um, the DNA was most coiled in the 16WW2 pore. Um, but uh, as you can see that um, DNA was also um, uh, fairly coiled in the 16FF2 pore and the 14F2 pore. So these both have phenylalanine in their constrictions. Um, but out of the two, uh, it was the least coiled in the 14F2 pore because of this pore being um, narrower overall uh, compared to the 16FF2 pore. So out of all of these pores, the 14F2 pore seems to be the most promising because uh, it slowed down uh, the DNA translocation and um, kept the strand in an um, almost linear conformation. Next, we wanted to see what happens when the DNA strand is under tension. Um, here we once again observe that um, the uh, DNA moved very quickly through the 14 LL2 pore and the uh, movement is much slower in the 16 WW2 pore. And um, it, this is because of DNA interacting with the tryptophan residues in the constriction. But this time we see some unexpected behavior in pores with the phenylalanine constrictions. So as you can see that um, the, the DNA was um, halted for long periods of time um, in both the 14F2 and the 16FF2 pores. Um, and DNA movement overall was much slower in these two pores compared to um, the 16WW2 pore, which is the opposite of the short flexible DNA. And when we had a closer look at the 14F2 pore, we saw that a DNA base was trapped in a pocket. Uh, formed by two phenylalanine side chains. And it's only after these two side chains move away from each other, like shown in, um, in the second picture. Um, and this happened at around 150 nanoseconds in this simulation, that um, DNA was once a bit again able to um, continue its movement through the pore. So remember here that DNA here is under tension. So it doesn't have the flexibility to coil and move around like the short DNA strands. So what's happening here is that the phenylalanine side chains are flexible and they're able to move around the DNA and trap the bases for long periods of time. Um, and the opposite was the case for the 16FF2 um, WW2 pore with the tryptophans. Um, even though DNA was um, stopped for a while, um, it wasn't for as long as um, in the pores with the phenylalanine constrictions. Um, and this, this tryptophan side chains were unable to form uh, pockets that were able to retain the um, DNA basis for very long periods of time, um, like we saw with phenylalanine. And we can quantify the flexibility of the residues by measuring the RMSF, which is the uh, root mean square fluctuation of the nanopore residues. So generally, um, the flexibility of the residues um, in the 16WW2 pole shown in blue here is much lower overall than the pores with the phenylalanine constrictions, um, which indicates that the tryptophan side chains were less mobile in these pores and, um, and therefore didn't form the pockets as often as the um, phenylalanine. Uh, so to summarize, um, 
this project, uh, we saw that um, both short flexible DNA and longer DNA strand under tension are slowed down in nanopores with uh, phenylalanine or tryptophan constriction regions. We observed the short DNA uh, to be most linear in the 14F2 pore, and it was more coiled in the 16 stranded pores. Um, and for longer DNA strand under tension, um, the translocation rate really depends on the whether the tryptophan or the phenylalanine um, side chains form pockets that can trap the DNA bases. And as this process is pretty random, the translocation rate is difficult to control. And phenylalanine residues are actually um, better than tryptophan at slowing down the translocation because of them uh, being more flexible and therefore more likely to form pockets that can retain um, the DNA. And out of all the pores, uh, the 14F2 pore um, is the most promising as it was able to retain the DNA um, in a near linear conformation when it's short and flexible. And it slowed down um, DNA translocation regardless of the DNA being flexible or under tension. So lastly, I would um, finish with what I'm currently working on. So uh, we're currently um, working on translating our design principles to real protein nanopores, uh, more specifically um, CSTG found in E. coli bacteria. And some key areas of interest include um, making nanopores more robust. So when we stress tested um, CSTG by applying a very high voltage, we saw that um, uh, the weakest region is in the um, beta barrel. And um, our next, so the next step is to design mutants that can make this region more robust. And we also want to characterize how DNA translocates through the nano, through these um, nanopores so that we can uh, work on optimizing that aspect further. And with that, I would like to thank uh, my supervisor, um, our very helpful group members, our collaborators and uh, funding sources and resources of computing power. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Poonam. Thank you. Um, so it seems we have uh, one question from the YouTube chat. Um, so I, I will propose um, uh, um, that you answer that question and then that you also, uh, if there's any sort of short note or, or message that you, you would like to leave. Um, so I will read out um, the, the question. Uh, are you uh, able to halt movement within the nanopore while the electric charge is still on to move the DNA? If so, which amino acid or other mechanism might you use? Okay, so that's a good question. Thank you. Um, so yes, um, we can. Uh, it, so it depends on the strength of the um, voltage that you use that can uh, really affect the movement of the DNA. I'm not sure if we can stop the DNA completely for very long periods of time, but we can slow it down, like we can really slow it down very much depending on the shape and uh, the shape of the pore and also the actual amino acids. So uh, like I said earlier, uh, we found that um, when the amino acids are charged, um, that actually really um, uh, does slow down DNA because uh, DNA um, has a, a negatively charged backbone. So the positive, um, if the um, amino acids are positive, they can form this interaction and DNA can be stopped at that region for a, a substantial amount of time before it moves down because of the voltage. Okay, thank you very much, Poonam. Thank you. Uh, so is there uh, any, any final words you'd like to uh, leave us with? 
Um, I would say that opportunities like these are us all coming together to um, attend this event as speakers and as listeners. This is what um, this is what makes science um, more exciting for me personally. So I highly encourage everyone to keep pursuing um, uh, events of interest and just uh, just absorb all the knowledge that you uh, and the exciting work that's going on. And that's the best way to do science, I think, as a community. So yeah, it's uh, events like today that make it that add, add that little sprinkle of happiness to science, I would say. Thank you very much for um, those words and thank you for uh, this wonderful uh, talk. Thank you so um, much for having me. Thank and I'll you. stop sharing my screen. Um, and we will now go to uh, the third and final talk of today. Uh, so the theme is using MD simulations to study transport across membranes. Uh, and I would like to uh, give the word to our speaker, Mariana Bunoro from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Thank you very much, Mariana. I believe you might be muted still. You're still on mute. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, can, uh, are, can you see my slides in the, the presentation mode or the? Is it correct? Yes, I, I believe so. Slides? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so uh, first of all, good, af good afternoon, and, and thank you for the the invitation and the introduction. So uh, today I'm. Um, I want to talk about uh, my previous project and also my current uh, project uh, of how to can use molecular dynamic simulations to study the transport across uh, membranes. But first of all, uh, we need to understand uh, the, the function of the, 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 the function of the membrane. Uh, so the primary function of the cellular membranes is to separate and protect the interior of the cell from uh, its surrounding. Uh, but at the same time, the cell needs to, to continue to exchange uh, materials and information with its environment in order to, to sustain its activity and also its growth. So the transmembrane brain uh, transport of uh, mole molecules of materials across the, 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 the cell membrane is one of the uh, most uh, fundamental and highly regulated process in the biology of, of, of the, the organism. And actually because of the importance of this process, uh, a cell can uh, dictate a large uh, fraction of its energy to implement uh, diverse mechanisms to facilitate the translocation of these materials across the, 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 the membrane. Uh, and normally the transport of molecules across the membrane uh, is carried by uh, different uh, types of proteins. Uh, uh, so the transport of the transmembrane exchange of species of molecules can occur uh, through different mechanisms. For example, uh, small molecules like uh, water molecules or oxygen can uh, be transported across the membrane uh, by simple diffusion mechanisms. So uh, this kind of diffusion me mechanism uh, doesn't require the assistance of proteins to, to transport these small molecules. However, uh, 
translocation of most uh, molecular species, uh, for example, ions, amino acids, or peptides, or uh, larger molecules, for example, drug molecules, or even entire proteins. Uh, the transport of these uh, species across the membrane uh, relies uh, on the function of a specialized protein uh, called channels or transporters. Uh, molecules uh, transported by channels, uh, uh, kind of transport, is called passive transport. Transport. Uh, it's called passive because it doesn't require a uh, uh, the cell uh, expends an energy, energy to promote the translocation of the membrane. On the other hand, uh, other species, other molecules, uh, requires uh, some source of energy to be transported across the membrane. And these, uh, this, this kind of transport is called active transport, and it, it's carried by uh, membrane proteins call it active membrane, uh, active membrane transporters. Uh, the first example that I, example that I, I, I would talk about, uh, it's uh, a project where I studied uh, a member of uh, the superfamily of proteins, uh, this active membrane transporter. Uh, and as you can see here, I'm showing some examples of active membrane transporters and we can, uh, an organ organism can have uh, can, uh, different uh, kind of transporters with different structures and also with different uh, mechanistic details. Uh, as I said, uh, the active transport requires the cell expen uh, expanding uh, energy, so it requires some source of energy. And uh, depending on the type of the, the protein, uh, each type protein use a uh, different uh, source of the energy. It can be, for example, uh, the ATP binding and hydrolysis. It can be, uh, or for example, the, the, the electrochemical gradient of uh, a specific ion, for example, the, the proton. Uh, but despite the diversity in the structure and in the mechanistic details uh, of the active uh, transporters, all of these proteins uh, operate through the same mechanism, and a mechanism called it, uh, alternate, alternate access mechanism. Uh, and these uh, mechanisms are uh, large uh, conformational chains expose the, the ligand binding site to uh, the either side of the membrane. So uh, basically this mechanism involves uh, two main uh, conformational uh, states. Uh, so initially the, 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 the transporter is in this uh, outward facing conformation where uh, the transport can bind to the molecule that will be transported. It also can bind uh, to the, the ion, here this is the proton. Uh, and then after the binding, uh, the, the transported transition transitions to uh, a second state called the occluded state, and then finally to the inward state where the, the ligand binding site is exposed to the inner side of the cell, and the, the ligand can be uh, can be can dissociate uh, in, into the cell. So, in the first uh, uh, example that I want to talk about, we studied a protein, uh, the member, uh, the protein member of the family of proteins called peptide coupled or oligopeptide transporter. It's a complicated name, but basically, this protein transport uh, pe peptide, small peptide, dying tripeptide from the outside of the cell uh, to the, into the cell. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, active transporters requires a uh, source of energy. And for uh, POTS, for the, the peptide transporter, they use uh, the, the proton flow uh, as its source of energy. And about uh, 
the, the structure of the, these proteins. They have, uh, they are formed by two domains. Here I'm showing uh, an N, oops, sorry, N and a C terminal domain. And in between these two domains uh, is, uh, we have these uh, ligand binding sites. Uh, and the, the accessibility uh, to, the, to the ligand binding site is controlled by the movement of specific regions of these proteins. Uh, so the accessibility from the, the periplasmic side of the cell so the, uh, is controlled by the movement of these pink helices here, helix one and two and seven and eight. And the accessibility uh, from the cytoplasmic side is controlled by the movement of the helix four and five and 11, 10 and 11. Uh, so, oh, sorry. so uh, we, uh, in this project, we wanted to understand how uh, the interaction with the peptide and how the protonation of a specific, a specific residues uh, could modulate uh, the transitions between the, in, the outward facing conformation and the inward facing conformation. And we also wanted to describe uh, what happens with the protein, what are the, the conformational uh, chains uh, associated with these uh, transitions. Uh, one way to describe uh, the, uh, the, conf the accessible conformations uh, of our system uh, is describing the free energy profile, the, the free energy landscape of the system. Uh, but to calculate the free energy, we need to have a good estimation of the, the probability of observing each of the states of our system. And sometimes in our simulation, uh, because these transitions, these, these different states are, uh, they are separated by high uh, free energy barriers. In our simulations, we, we are not able to sample all the important uh, all the, bi the, the, the relevant biological conformation. So sometimes we have to use uh, some tricks to force our system to sample all the, the, the important conformation. Uh, this is actually a, a, a set of, a set of uh, methodologies called enhanced sampling simulations. And specifically in this project, we used a methodology called adaptive biasing for simulation. Uh, and the idea of Briefly, the, the idea of this methodology is applying uh, an external force to our system to force uh, the, the, the system uh, transition from one state to another state. So uh, here in the, 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 the equation of motion, we have this additional term here, which is the, the, the bias force that we use to drive the system from one state to the other state. So then we calculated the, the free energy profile uh, for the uh, protein, for the peptide transported protein in four different uh, situations, four different conditions. So we started this system uh, when it, it is uh, in the absence of the ligand and also in the absence of the proton. Uh, we also started the system uh, bound to a dipeptide uh, but uh, without protonation. Um, but uh, we also included a, a protonation, but uh, we, uh, we simulated the system uh, with uh, some uh, with a specific residue protonated, but without the ligand. And finally, we started the system uh, in the presence of the ligand and also protonated. And here, when we compare. Uh, we when we compare the free energy profiles of each of these systems, uh, we, uh, we can, uh, I think the simplest way, the simplest way to, to, to analyze this, this picture, the, this free energy profile here is first uh, analyzing the effect of the, the, the ligand. So we are comparing these two systems with these two systems here. So when we don't have the ligand bound to 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 be transported, we have a uh, just we have this uh, free energy minimum uh, located here, 
Uh, and this uh, area here are, are, is associated with structures like this. So we have uh, the peptide, uh, here we have uh, the, the ligand binding uh, site, and we can see that in, in this kind of structure, the ligand binding site is, assess is accessible only through the, the cytoplasm side. So, uh, so it means that the, the transporter is in the, in the inward facing conformation. However, when we include the ligand, uh, this free energy minimum here is associated with this kind of conformation, where the, the ligand binding site is not accessible. Uh, it's not accessible. So we can see that uh, both the, cytopla the cytoplasmic and the periplasmic gates are closed. So this is the occluded conformation. So we can say that the the ligand induce the transition from the inward facing conformation to the outward facing conformation. On the other hand, when we look at the, the effect of the protonation, when we protonate our system, uh, especially when I have the, the ligand bound to the transporter, you can see here a second free energy minimum. Uh, and this free energy minimum is uh, associated with this kind of structure where we have the, the ligand binding site accessible only to, to the, the periplasmic side uh, of the cell, and it's blocked from the, the cytoplasmic side, which means the, the, the protein, the transporter, is in the outward facing conformation. So the protonation induces the, the, the transition from the occluded uh, state to the outward facing state. Uh, as a professor Helbert mentioned, we also it's also it's always important to compare our, our data uh, with uh, experimental data if we have some experimental data available. So here we compared uh, our free energy profiles with available uh, crystallographic structures for uh, the, this protein. So this, here I'm showing you uh, three, uh, the three uh, black dots here. They represent uh, crystallographic structures where the protein adopts the inward facing conformation. And this is exactly uh, the, the conformation for, that corresponds to this uh, free energy profile, free energy minima here. And on the other hand, uh, we also have uh, another uh, experimental uh, structure of the transporter in the occluded conformation, which is the yellow dot, the yellow star. Uh, and it is, and it is its uh, structure uh, falls uh, in the in the free energy minima uh, associated with the occluded conformation. So our uh, simulations were able to reproduce the, the experimental data and we also we were also able to to observe the the outward facing conformation which uh, uh, for which we didn't have any uh, experimental data at that moment at, at that point so uh, just uh, to summarize the this first example uh, I just wanted to show you how we can use, uh, how we can explore the free energy landscape of proteins to this and this uh, energetic point of view to characterize uh, all, not all, but to characterize important uh, and the, the biological, uh, biologically relevant uh, conformational uh, state of a protein and how we can uh, use these uh, free energy profiles to compare the effect of for example, a mutation or a ligand or the interaction of a ligand or a protonation of a specific residue. Uh, I'm not sure if I have time, but briefly, I just wanted to, to, to mention a second uh, product that I'm working on. It's a much more complex system. Uh, it, it, it's also a membrane transporter, but uh, while the, the previous system transported transport only uh, a small molecule, a dipeptide or a tripeptide. Peptide. 
this uh, system, this, this transporter here, is responsible to transport uh, entire uh, proteins across the membrane. Uh, and it, actually, the, this, this, this transport system uh, is not formed by only one protein, but it's actually formed by three proteins. Uh, and briefly, uh, we believe that uh, in, in the absence of the, 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 the ligand, uh, the ligand, the absence of the substrate, substrate is the protein that will be transported in the absence of the substrate, the transporter adopted these uh, resting state. Uh, and after the interaction with the, the substrate, uh, the, the transporter uh, transitions to uh, an active state. So here you can see that the position of the top A and top B molecules, they, 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 they change the, their position. Uh, so they change their binding site. And also uh, the interaction with the substrate uh, allows the recruitment of more molecules of top A, which is the, the red, the, the pink molecule, uh, and uh, which allows the formation of this pore to transport the substrate. It's a, it's a very complicated mechanism. Uh, and we just said, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this system is composed by, by three proteins, uh, top A, top B, and top C. And we, but actually this, the, the system acts as a trimer. Uh, so we have a, the complete uh, transporters formed by three copies of uh, each of those proteins. And in this project, we wanted to understand how uh, the interaction with the, the substrate can trigger the, the formation of the pore. And also we, we want to understand where this top A protein can bind, where this top A protein binds to the trimer to allow the formation of the pore. Experimentally, we know that top A can bind to one of the specific helix, the front membrane helix five, or to the front membrane helix six but we don't know how this pore can be formed. So we use this kind of uh, setup to, to study the, the binding of top A to the trimer, uh, to the, the transporter. Uh, and we simulated this system, uh, we simulated three different systems, three different configurations. Uh, to see if we could uh, observe uh, the, the binding sites. Uh, and here, I, I think I try to color the binding site in, in, in this dark pink here. I think you can see most of the, the red molecules, top eight proteins bind, binds to, to the trembling brain helix one, which is the, the, the pink region here. Uh, so uh, with these simulations, we could uh, we could observe a new binding site, which we believe is essential for the formation of the pore. And we also could observe that oops, without that without uh, one of the proteins, without the, the green protein, the top B protein uh, here. Uh, Interaction with the, uh, the interaction with top A completely deforms the structure of the pore, the, 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 the structure of the, the trimer. So the top B protein acts like a glue, keeping the, the structure of the, the, the protein of the transporter. And just to finish, uh, we also, uh, well, as the Function of this transport of this transporter uh, is transport entire proteins across the membrane. We also simulated uh, the same system, but using uh, but in the presence of the the substrate. Uh, and again, uh, we could see that that uh, the top A molecules, which are the molecules that form the pore. They bind uh, for all of the configurations that we try to simulate. 
they always uh, bind preferentially here in the interface between uh, in, in this interface opposite to the to the to the subunit where the, the substrate binds. So we believe so for now uh, at this stage we believe that the pore uh, is formed here uh, in this interface between two subunits. Especially when we have uh, when we start our simulation with one of these pink molecules, with the top A ba uh, bound to one of these uh, subunits. Uh, and also in our simulations, we could see that the the presence of the ligand uh, also induces a kind of breathing movement. So we can see that when the, the, the substrate is down to the primer to be to be transported. The transport is much more flexible, exhibiting this kind of opening and closing movement that we call it breathing movement. Uh, just uh, this is, I think, this is my last slide. When uh, we added more and more and more molecules of these uh, pink, uh, of these pink molecules, more of top A molecules, more of top A proteins in our system. And we simulated for more and more and more time, we could observe this kind of structure here. This is not a, a, a real pore, uh, uh, it, it doesn't have the dimension, uh, uh, it's not big enough to transport the, the substrate, but uh, we believe this is the, the initial for the stage of the pore formation. Uh, So this is uh, so uh, this is uh, another example of how we can use uh, molecular dynamic simulation. That actually, this uh, here we are using coarse grain simulation, different kind of methodology to explore uh, these huge systems with millions of atoms and uh, and also very complicated mechanism uh, mechanism uh, to transport uh, small molecules or even huge uh, molecules like proteins across uh, the membrane. So uh, finally, I just wanted to thank my, uh, the group of my former supervisor in Brazil and uh, Anton Watts, which was a collaborator uh, in, in the first project and also my current supervisor, Christian Stout, here in the, the University of Warwick. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana. Uh, for the the wonderful talk as well. So um, I will propose that we uh, uh, very quickly. So th there is one question uh, from the YouTube chat. Um, may there be two way transport at the same time, uh, be it passive, active, or a combination of the two? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, what can happen uh, for the, the active transporters? Uh, we can have. Uh, uh, active transporters can be uh, divided into two kind of transporters, uh, primary or secondary transporters. Uh, and secondary transporters, they can transport at, uh, not only the, the, the molecule uh, that is the, the main goal, like the peptide, or, uh, but it also transport uh, ions, for example. But it, 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 it still requires the energy. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I would uh, now also like to ask you if there are any um, final words, uh, any final notes that you'd like to, to leave us with? Well, uh, I think my, my final word, uh, when, when Tony invited me, uh, he mentioned that he wanted to show you that, uh, I think for me, the, 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 the biggest message is that uh, we are a connected uh, team. So we, I'm from Brazil, so the science uh, allows us to work with different people uh, in the world. Uh, I'm from Brazil, there I worked with Tony, and now I'm here in the UK working uh, in another great group. I think this, for me, this is the, the idea of science. We don't do science alone. We always need to collaborate with other people and this kind of event. I think it's uh, especially important to show how we can, uh, I, I believe most of the, the researchers that 
were presented here uh, were done uh, in collaboration, especially if in, in the molecular dynamic simulations. We are it's always important to 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 collaborate with experimentally. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so it seems we have uh, essentially reached the the end of this third and final day uh, of um, of our event. Um, so naturally, I would like to um, thank all of uh, today's speakers, um, uh, Helmut, uh, Punam, and Mariana. I would like to also thank um, all speakers uh, from uh, the event in general. Uh, I would like to thank everyone that um, essentially followed us through the event, um, uh, through the course of these three days. Uh, and of course, thank everybody from IAPS and IUPAB, uh, Anthony Watts uh, included, uh, Zlatan and Ruhi, uh, who also chaired uh, the other two days uh, for all the work that was put into this event. Uh, and of course, a, a final um, a message for everybody to continue following IAPS uh, and IUPAB and all the events uh, that the organizations um, uh, put into practice uh, to make sure that uh, science is truly international and it is a, a truly collaborat collaborative uh, experience. Uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, finally thank um, IAPS for the invitation to chair this third day. So, thank you everybody for following us and um, uh, we will possibly see each other in other events. <laughs>